going to the strategic design event here at the Little Rock Center. Um, we're actually going to begin with an invocation, and that invocation will be provided by um, VP Nez, and I'll allow her to introduce herself and um, elaborate on what she does for our college. So I'll give the time to Vice President Marie Nez, and she will be able to provide our invocation. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marie Naz. I am the Vice President of External Campuses and Sites at Diné College, Banashnish, Banashnish, and Shido, Ashini Bashashin, Kachitni, Bashashido, Purishini, Aina, Bashinale, Ikeha, Kwaige, Asinago, Kashok, Tourism, Aya, Bahadishi, Sobe, Ahidi, Si, Kwaya, Sahale, and Bashadomi. So let's pray. Citizen, not Igi, so that art for Benigni, 
this movie and she be calling it out. So I don't want the chance to leave me. Sonny done leave me home within the hard time. I don't want to get the last go and I'm then not only done leverage me. Going for the whole part and leave me called out for the name me or left. Out for the finish me or left me. So I want the chance to be to the Zimbi that I have never be the next year. Good out is to the Zimbi me in the art or left the art or then to be which one has been or left the one has been. Which one has been. Which one has been. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Winifred to go over um, the introduction uh, of what <coughs> we are doing here at the Beach House for the strategic plan. Winnie? Thank you, uh, VP Nez. Uh, I actually wanted to use this time to also introduce um, a key staff member here at our Windrock Center. So I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Nicholas Begay to provide a small introduction because he is the contact here for our site in Window Rock. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Nicholas Begay. I'm the Window Rock Center Manager. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for joining in today for this town hall meeting. And yeah. Okay, thank you again, Nicholas. Um, yeah, it's eight on to a shay ya winner for a jumbo unish yet. Now, Kate and Nishle, do it, and is any a bushes chain. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, all of our guests in the audience. Welcome to our Diné College um, Window Rock Center here. Um, today we're going to actually um, discuss our strategic design and we entitle it um, The Roadmap for the Future at Diné College. So, we uh, have an audience joining on Facebook Live through YouTube, so welcome to our campus virtually. Um, so the purpose of our design is to create a strategic design that will be utilized for the upcoming years. Um, the specific idea is to interact and connect with our community members, stakeholders, also the greater, larger Diné College community to ensure transparency, progression, for the new goals that we intend to create, um, as well as the objectives associated to them. Another intent we do have is to be innovative, so we want to be transformative, also maintain a collective message about what the college sees as the future of its um, institutional goals. So that's what we're doing right now. So in a larger sense, we want to hear feedback from the community that we are interacting with on a daily basis, um, not in only in academic sense, but also in more of the community alignment sense. Um, so the process of the design is included here on this map. We will begin with the planning. <laughs> we will begin with the planning, um, and then we'll actually, we're in number two phase, which is outreach. So we're going out into the communities and sharing um, what we have in mind and what we plan to do as far as an institution. We also will have the review and assessment and modification piece and that's going to be inclusive of the stakeholders committee as well. And that's an internal stakeholders committee and an external stakeholders committee. Eventually we will reach number six which is the implementation phase and then seven which is the completion of the actual objectives and goals but then we have to actually <laughs> maintain those goals and make sure that we're delivering what we said in those goals throughout the years to come. Another thing that we have to discuss here is the timeline. So initially in phase one, we actually met as the executive team, which are individuals here. There is Dr. Russell, um, VP Nez, Dr. Garrity, as well as um, Mr. Jim here, and more individuals were also on that team, and they met with our board of regents, our governing board, discuss the strategic themes associated to what we intend to do um, with our goals and objectives. And number two, we're again um, in that phase of reaching out to the public and then June to July we'll have the review assessment and modification components and then hopefully by September 2022 we'll have completed this project. Now there's the core implementation team that I was referring to earlier. There's a guiding team which consists of the provost and the vice president of finance and administration, VP of student success, VP of external campuses and centers and microsites. 
Also, the executive team, um, as you can see there, there's representation from um, project operations to information technology, um, also our executive assistants, and that is what we are working with. And stakeholders committee, as I mentioned earlier, there's the internal and external um, committees, and their job basically is to review all the comments, all the recommendations, all the feedback that we receive through surveys or at these town hall meetings. And actually they're going to use that feedback and really assess how it's going to come into play when we're developing our overall objectives and goals. And of course there's going to be a sense of um, prioritization when this happens. Um, we do want to hear everyone's input, but we also understand that we have to prioritize the needs in the academic sense and then of course of a financial um, sense as an institution. So on here you have representation from our school deans, our faculty, our student representatives, our faculty association, and of course our staff association. Um, on the other end, the external side, there's businesses, community organizations, of course we want to be inclusive of K through 12 school organizations, traditional representation, um, traditional practitioner, of course that's a really important to the aspect of Dine College, uh, donors, as well as local community members and alumni. And if you're a local community member in the audience virtually or here and you want to be a part of it, please let me know and that way we can get your information. Um, here are the outreach events that we have planned. <coughs> of course, we're starting with confirmed outreach event schedules. Uh, we do have the ones highlighted up on top, the four, that are coming um, at us very quickly and they're internally um, designed within our site of the Nick College and hopefully we do hear from each and every one of you um, out in the communities there. And it's your opportunity to share how you feel the Nay College is a part of your community and then vice versa, how are we a part of your community. Um, the communication details, of course, we also want to make sure that you guys have access to what we're talking about. Um, we have a website there and you can go to it anytime that you need to to find updates on our timeline or upcoming events, press releases contact information and things of that nature. Um, so that concludes what we are doing today in terms of the strategic design. Now I'm going to hand over the time to Dr. Russell and he's going to elaborate on what is happening in terms of our strategic themes that we have come up with. Good morning everybody. Um, I guess first I want to make sure, because I saw some text there, that people can hear through this. Are they okay? Because I think Bo mentioned that somebody talking earlier. We're good? Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Monty Russell. I'm the president of the Net College. Uh, you know, what I, what I wanted to start with right off the bat, though, is kind of talk about the, the process and the use of words in this process. Primarily, we're all familiar with um, a strategic plan. We know we sit there and that's what, you know, if you Google strategic strategy, it comes up strategic planning process and all of this. We're very cognizant of that. But we also understand that one of the things that we learned within the pandemic is that you can't plan. You know, the best, thing, you know, the, the, the old adage, the best laid plans, you know, the idea that planning only really works if you control all the variables. If you don't control all those variables, you have to be agile enough to be able to say, if this happens, we do this, but if it doesn't happen, we can do that. And that's more about design. If you think about designing, a lot of times if you think about it in terms of technology, they have design teams that are looking at issues. And there, they're not looking at all the variables, but they're looking at how can we be agile enough to address what we know now, but also what we don't know. And that's a really, I think, a, a, a strong reason going forward. The old strategic plan that we had in place up until this past 2021 Nobody knew the pandemic was coming. Technology was important, but it wasn't the most important thing. It was low on the list. Then the pandemic comes, and all of a sudden, sudden something that is low on the list 
And one of the reasons it's low on the list is expensive. All right, how do you, you know, we'd like to get to this level of broadband access, but it costs so much money, we don't have that money. So you know what, as a priority, what we try to do is make incremental steps. And then overnight, almost about this time last, you know, two years ago, the whole world changed. And now all of a sudden technology, what was something that was gonna be incremental, all of a sudden becomes the most important thing. All classes go online. Broadband rooms become important and Zoom rooms and all this new technology just comes crashing through the door. It's kind of like a fire hydrant and you're trying to drink water from it. That really showed us something going forward. So part of this process then that we're looking at is that we want to make sure that we don't become confined with predetermined and pre-selected solutions to things we won't even know about two years from now, three years from now. Are we in a pandemic? Are we in an endemic? What are we going to be doing now? How do we change the way we have in, you know, face-to-face -face classes as opposed to online classes? And so part of this strategic design process is to hear from everybody else. So we're not really here to, you know, with questions or comments to explain and, and, or, or to contradict or try to answer them. What we're really here to do is to listen. What we're here to do is to clarify. What we're here to do is explain a little bit but not project our ideas onto all of you. The whole process here is to hear from everybody else. This is something that this college has not done a lot of in the past. We started this process by bringing people together, but before we even did that, we evaluated all the previous strategic planning processes. How were they conducted? Who conducted them? Who was in charge of them? What did they do with recommendations? Were they successful? So we started this process by saying, let's do that research. And we did. And that's where we learned that a lot of the designs, a lot of the, you know, we have a, the strategic goals that are by the door there are kind of the same thing that we've seen in the last 30 years. So that's not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. That's not a bad thing at all. That was prior to the pandemic. There was a certain thought process, and that's fine. But for us to be able to look to the future, we have to try to do things a little differently. And so we set out, and I, I want to thank Winifred Jumbo for taking this on. We set out to be, from the very beginning, how do we be in, innovative? How do we be creative? And that's hard. You, know, you just can't command someone to say, you know, Mr. Jim, be creative. Mr. Jim, be innovative, right? It has to be contextualized. What is it that you're trying to do? Okay, let's try to find a different way. This is what we've done in the past. What about this? And we move forward. So I think I wanted to provide that kind of background a little bit in terms of what we're looking for. We're looking for a dialogue with everybody. We're looking for the opportunity to hear some new ideas, concerns that you might have. And I think so that's what we start with. Now, I don't have everything memorized here, so I don't know if at some point we can put up the, uh, the, the, the goals or I can look at them over there, but I will start with the first one. So the first strategic theme, and so what we did is we got the, uh, the Board of Regents together, we got the administrative team together, and we started identifying what are the themes that we're looking at. In the old days, we had like the net identity. Um, I can't see sideways too well, but we had nation building. We had different, those were our themes. So going forward, what we wanted to do is say, okay, that's good, they're not bad. But what we wanted to do is say, let's try to do something different this time. Let's be a little bit more innovative. Let's be a little bit more creative and less concrete. Less, oh, here's a table and this way it has to be solid. Something that's more agile. So the first strategic theme that we identified is quality and growth. So we want to hear from people, what does that mean to you? You know, one of the things that we had come to us 
was this idea, okay, I have a goal, we have a goal of being, right now we're around because of the pandemic, about 1,300 students, we were around 1,500. Our goal is by 2030 to be at 3,000. That means we want to double our enrollment in right now eight years. Okay, that's growth, that's what you first think about. But the other part of that is, what is growth? It's also the number of programs that are offered. It's also talking about, okay, what kind of services are offered. So growth can mean something different to everybody. So we want to have your, your thoughts and ideas on what does it mean to you. The other part is we never talk about quality. We never talk about this is what we need to do. We need to meet this standard. We want better faculty. We want better staff. We want better admission processes. That's about quality. So what does quality mean to everybody else? What does it mean for Winderock? Because Winderock program development and growth and quality is different from Tuba City. There are different, this is the head of our Navajo Nation government. There are certain things that are here that are specific to Winderock, just like on the western side of the reservation. So that's why we're going to all these different areas as we go forward. But that was the first one about quality and growth. What does growth mean? What does quality mean? How can we try to identify that? So the process right now, as we move forward, is we've identified the themes, all right? We've identified the themes, but the objectives and the goals that go with those themes, that's what this process is all about as we move forward, okay? So quality growth, means, the other thing that means, if you look at it more as a, uh, uh, a sentence, if you will, quality growth, if you just think about that, not as two separate words, but one, that it's talking about the quality of your growth, right? You don't just become big for any reason. You have to make sure that as you grow, you're providing that support. So students are in a position where they're actually pro being provided the support they need as you grow. You don't just get so big that you forget about the needs of students. You don't just get so big and you forget about the needs of the faculty. So that's the, 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 the first theme that we want to get some feedback on. So, Winnie, you want to go to the... Okay, accessibility. A lot of these themes came out of the pandemic. Think about that. How do you still access college when, you, when the colleges lock their doors, right? So how do you do that? And how do you access college when you don't have internet at home? You don't have Wi-Fi. You don't have a McDonald's in your community. You don't have places to get that. It doesn't mean that college then is only for those who can afford it, whether at a school, whether at a, 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 a home, wherever that is. It means we have, the that college has a responsibility to make it accessible. So what does that mean to all of you? Does it mean increasing online courses? Does it mean increasing you know, arrangements with different people in terms of providing access? We have some ideas, and we'll be sharing them as in the next process. Right now, we want to hear from, from all of you and gather it. But what does it mean by accessibility? Let's say you can get here to Winter Rock, but you have three little kids. Can you still get here? I can get to this building. I can log on to the class, but what about my children? So accessibility is not just about being able to walk in the front door, it's about making sure there are services once you walk into that front door so you can devote your time to learning going forward. So accessibility, trying to expand that idea of accessibility is really important for us. Campus health and wellness. Again, you can imagine that this came out of the pandemic idea, but it's also something that's really important as we think about this. One of the things that come out of this is that when you talk about campus health and wellness, first thing you think about is the wellness and the health of the students. That's important. Are we providing services that are needed for them? Right, that's important. What about the faculty? What about the staff? 
So the idea, that's about the individual. But it's also about the actual campus. You know, it, are things there the way they need to be? Do you feel comfortable when you come into Winter Rock Center here? Are your needs provided in terms of being able to be in a position to, to learn, to earn your degree, and to move forward? So this is really, I think, something that's a little bit more than just the obvious of making sure that everyone is healthy and we have, you know, a, a, a quality wellness program. So part of this is moving forward. And what you see on the screen here are, are ideas that we started generating. They're, they're there to help prompt you. You can look at that and say, you know what, I don't really need housing. I don't think that's, that, that's a big deal for me. So it's a way to get all of you to think about what we were thinking when we developed the theme and to promote and prompt some you know, feedback, ideas, questions, whatever that means. You may ask about, you know, be alert and aware of our surroundings. What does that have to do? That's what we're also here for. As we show this, is to help kind of prompt and get some answers from all of you in these areas. I know one of them, one of them is holistic <coughs> integration. So what does that mean? Because it sounds kind of big, and some of these themes are big because we have to fit a lot under them. But one of the things that this means right now is ensuring that when we talk about the future program, let's say we go into aerospace you know, engineering, that if we devise that type of a program, that we ensure that we still remain true to the mission of this college, that we integrate and infuse Navajo culture, uh, Navajo educational philosophy within those new programs. So we've already started doing some of this. And one of the things that we've done is the first step in the development of a new program is to ensure there is integration of the net philosophy into the curriculum, not just into the syllabus. So part of this is making sure that when we look at this integration, that one of the problems you know, we always have is we silo things, right? If you want to go to get financial aid, go to this office. If you want to go get you know, advising, go to this office. If you want to go to the faculty, go. How do we try to make it easier for our students? How do we integrate all of those elements of what a student needs into our program design? into our student support design? Those are questions we don't know the answers to yet. But it's part of the things that we'll never get an answer unless we start asking the right questions. So part of this idea of holistic integration is how do we try to work more seamlessly? One of the challenges we have in Indian country as well as at a college is about the finances. So if we're not integrated, we're wasting money. And if we're wasting money, we can't give more services to students. We can't provide more academic programs. So part of this process is to say, how do you become more efficient and effective, which then allows you that growth we talked about earlier, right? So this, they're all kind of connected as we go forward, and I think it's important to remember that. Next slide. I'll write these down next time, so if it's too, but I'll have them in front of me. Make it easier. <laughs> so culture and environment. The first response and idea there is, oh, they're talking about Navajo culture. How do we try to do it? No, that is a part. That's, that runs through everything we do. But what this is talking about, and I'll use this as an example all the time. In fact, it happened here in this room. When I first applied for this position, I had students at the different sites I went to they came up to me here at Winter Rock, Ship Rock, and Tuba City. Nobody at, at, uh, uh, at uh, Say Lee. But they said, essentially, can you make them be nicer to us? That's a student asking, can you make the college nicer to us? That's what we're talking about, the, the, the campus culture, the campus environment, how people greet you when you come in. 
you know, you walk in, you've had a hard night, you say you have kids, they were up all night, they were sick, you go to class in the morning, you walk in, and somebody just says, what do you want? What are you here for? You know, that puts you at a diff different frame of mind. So that idea of a welcoming culture, and we see it, and we know it when we see it. Where when you walk in the door, you just feel like you belong. That sense of belonging is important. Tribal colleges, in some ways, were created because of that idea of belonging. So a big part of this is talking about customer service. Accountability. If somebody is not treating somebody right, they're accountable. We talk about this college being the, one of the foundational elements is our, our relationships to each other. And yet, as soon as somebody walks out the door, we start gossiping about them. That's about the culture and the environment. How do we practice what we preach? How do we hold ourselves accountable to what we talk about? And you as students, you feel it. You know that. I don't have to bring that up and think, oh, they, they, I don't know what they do. They don't understand what I'm talking about. No, you feel it. The welcoming atmosphere that a faculty gives to you, the welcoming atmosphere that security gives to you, I mean, security, think of that word. It's about security, right? How do you feel when you come on a campus? How are you greeted? That's important. How can we improve it? What should be our goals in this area? You notice I'm not listing things about what we want to do, what this means to us, and we want to do this, and we want to, that's what we're here for. We want to listen first. Go ahead, Winnie. Facilities, that's obvious. We were just talking about this a little while ago, how, boy, this room's really <laughs> nice and hot, right? You know, and I say that myself because as I, I sweat here and, and whatnot, but that idea of just, the facilities have to provide what you need to get your degree, whether it's technology, whether it's having you know, um, buildings that matter. <laughs> you know, I remember, you know, in, in my previous job as director of the Bureau of Indian Education, I went up to Minnesota. I like this, and it reminded me because it's so windy. But there was this school up there that it was in a metal, like a metal building. And when the wind would blow, like it is right now, in the classrooms, it was that corrugated metal. Right? It wasn't insulated, so they just blew. But when that wind blew, it <laughs> non-stop. And they expected students to learn. And then they wondered, why aren't students learning? So the idea of facilities having an influence on the success of your students is obvious. If you're a chemistry major, we don't have that yet, but if you're a chemistry major and you don't have the lab to do the experiments and to understand what chemistry is all about, you're at a disadvantage. So we have to make sure that we're building the buildings to meet what it is we all decide here for the next decade. What new programs? So facilities are important. And it's just not about building new facilities. Look at this campus right here. Right? Our goal is to rebuild this. We really were looking at trying to build our new campus along the highway, like a storefront, really big, that at college and people see that. There's hardly any land. Think about all the land problems we have here on the reservation. So there are other things that we have to think about, but still, we want to build a law school. Mr. Rexley Jim, you know, had a convening a couple of years ago with people from all over the country about building a law school. We wanted it to be here so it could be close to DOJ, close to the uh, Navajo Nation Council, close to the executive branch, close to the judicial system. We've been looking for land for two and a half years now. So facilities are important not just about today and fixing what's broken, but thinking about 10 years from now, what are you going to build? What programs are you interested in? 
And that's what we're looking at right now to hear from everybody. So I believe that's the last one. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over to Winifred. I just want to say thank you all for coming. Uh, students that are here, staff that are here, friends of the college that are here. Um, thank you for coming as we continue this conversation. <coughs> Okay, so um, you are our guest here in the corner, everyone. <laughs> um, we have the opportunity for you to share your feedback and your thoughts on some of these items that were discussed. And we would really appreciate it because we often sit among ourselves and talk about things. And it's really um, great when you hear a new perspective because it allows us to think outside the box as well. So. Before then, I am, so start thinking about it. <laughs> uh, before then, I'm gonna give the time over to Dr. Garrity, and Dr. Garrity is gonna introduce herself, and she is a representation of our academic um, side of the college, so Dr. Garrity. The <laughs> University <laughs> institution look like at the new college at our nation's college the beat non daidil kit a ko ishi bin na chit ban so ke so a de na idol kit do le a do he ha na dish in do le kwa no yan ki chit de okay thank you um so now again we're back to the purpose and guidelines of community feedback so um hey everyone on youtube channel for the new college i know there is uh, some clarification that is needed so you can actually <clears throat> submit your comment on our Facebook live stream with YouTube. So basically how you do that is you just go onto our Facebook page for our Diné College. Um, and then there, there we're, we're pretty much um, having a video on display. You just go under there and you comment. Like you can send in a comment there. Um, we would really appreciate it if you guys do so. Um, I know that it requires you to go back one tab, I guess you would say, in your browser there, but if you could just do that, that would be great. Um, we are unfortunately not able to um, allow the comments directly on the YouTube page at this time, but you know we do have that option for you to go on Facebook. And then um, for our live audience um, here in the Wendell Rock Center, uh, we do have some guidelines. We give you three minutes um, to state your question or your recommendation or feedback. And we just have our housekeeping rules here. Um, we did all review the strategic themes together. Uh, be respectful to others. Be aware of the time frame allocation, which is three minutes. Be patient. Uh, do not interrupt others. Uh, and we just want to respect each other's differing thoughts or opinions and value inputs, and we are following the agenda. So do you, as our guest, have any um, feedback? The floor is yours. Um, I'm, we're here on behalf of Department for Self-Reliance. Um, I have here my EBS from our section and then our training instructor as well. Um, so what we, purpose of why we wanted to come here today was uh, we have been in talks a little bit of partnering with for, for the adult basic education. Uh, we would like to further the partnership with uh, the various 
um, degrees and certifications that you will offer. Uh, we currently we offer a partnership with San Juan College. Um, it has been successful. We have been in partnership with them for uh, for botany technicians, uh, pharmacy techs, uh, CNAs. Um, so we have our own cohort. The reason being is because uh, because the the customer base that we serve are TANA clients. Those are who are under you know um, at or below poverty guidelines. So we come in and help them to further their education or career goals. And in doing so, we partner with uh, colleges to provide a smaller, uh, more direct service uh, partnerships to provide these trainings and new classes for them. Just because the customers that we serve, they're not always able to um, you know, go to regular classes just as the public would or any other outside non-DSR customers would. So um, they find more comfort in this and it's more accessible to them. It, they're able to um, have more of the success rate as they would if, if they were to part or if they were to participate outside of um, this non-DSR cohort. And um, the reason also is because we have a team here that supports them in doing that. So we provide that extra support, that coaching, uh, all of that stuff. So, I mean, uh, just reading about these things and hearing about your your goals and your strategic planning, I think it's a great opportunity that you're bringing to the Navajo people. And it would be good if we could partner with you all to uh, help further this and to boost that, that Navajo or Native uh, customer base on our end too. Because we feel that, um, you know, well actually, just based off the, the customer feedback that we get, um, they're very grateful for the opportunities that we provide for them and offering it to them at a smaller class size, um, being more geared in, and uh, tailored to what their needs are. So um, uh, I think that the more individualized approach of it is what has led us to have a really great successful outcome to what our customers um, go in succeeding in their certifications and their career and educational endeavors. So. Um, with that, I, I think that it's a great opportunity. We we support it, and we would like to be a part of it as well. Thank you. Thank you um, for your um, feedback and recommendations. We appreciate it. So, can I, can I ask a question to clarify? Um, yeah. So, like with San Juan College, right? Are you talking to the, just for the area? around like in New Mexico uh -huh. so like if you're in a different area say Tuba City or is that something that we could look at so for us by geography really? yeah we offer to all of our field offices so we have field offices in Chinle, Tuba City, Kayanta, um, Farmington, Gallup, Winter Rock, and Greasewood so we have cut we advertise the, the certification trainings to all of our offices so whatever customer is interested in um, that type of cohort, for example, if it's pharmacy tech, a customer from Chinle is interested in that, we would provide those support services for them to provide transportation, uh, meals, anything like that to help them complete and succeed in their certification graduation. Question. Um, do you have data in regards to what this, the, the interests are and, the, and, and could you provide that to us so we know exactly what their interests are? Um, we could probably provide a report in regards to their um, the interest goals that they have, the employment and career goals that they do have. So we could probably provide that to you, but that would be just geared towards our specific customers only people who are enrolled on our program. Are these college uh, like credits, or are they like CEU credits so that we, they're receiving? We tend to partner with colleges that will honor or have them, uh, they're able to stack those, those certifications towards a higher degree. So like a CNA would be able to be honored at San Juan College, or a different organization that would go towards like a RN or BSN or something. This is very specific and direct, 
So maybe you can leave a card and yeah. we'll, we're very interested in this. Yeah, and I think to other people, the idea that we're looking at is accessibility. So one of the things we talked about is creating a, a uh, CEU program. Uh -huh. I know you're talking about college bearing credit, which is <coughs> fine too, mm -hmm. but trying to meet the needs of what people, like an open university idea also. So this is something that I think we'd be very interested in. It's something that we have thought about uh -huh. and we'd love the opportunity to sit down with you right. and not wait till September 22, right? I mean, I think we can reach out to you <laughs> in the next couple <laughs> days, okay? Um, actually, on our screen here, we have um, Glenita. Glenita? Um, she would like to share um, a few words, but I'm not sure if the echo will be too much. Here we have. Um, yes, up here. Glenita? Glenita? No, um, but I'll go ahead and she shared it with me through chat, but she wants to also mention that um, certificate of attendance programs um, here at uh, the St. Lee campus that she's working with directly with the Chimley Self-Reliance Office. So she is in conversation with some of these types of programs. So I guess it would be a great opportunity just to reconnect and get those programs going. And um, VP Haskey is our Vice President of uh, Student Affairs, so she has some conversations going with your Chinle Self-Reliance Department. And she said thank you very much for joining us. Okay, is there anyone else who, who would like to share some feedback or comment, Terry? I would. Okay. Um, I work specifically with the customers who don't have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And I work in the areas of Rama, Alamo, Dohajale, Crown Point, and the vicinity of Gallup. Since 2007, a lot of our clients want to go to school but lack the high school diploma. And I worked with Shiprock campus and Crown Point campus, but that's limited to the satellite areas. What I see that would shine in my eye is to have a chapter house equipped to bring students there to their communities and to have the set up there. And that constant communication with the college, the clients, and myself, so we can work with them to gain that high school skill. Then that same cohort can be put into like maybe nursing, um, NASA, what else is out there? There's many things that they can do, they want to do it, it's just that little barrier that they're facing, that little barrier that they need to get over. When they do that, and you know, it's wonderful to see their growth. And they become their, their child's role model. So that gears their children to gain their high school diploma faster. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. I really appreciate those comments because I think, you know, kind of going back to those themes, you know, and this is what I mean by it, it's integrated. You're talking about accessibility. What about those students that, you know, they have the hurdle of getting, of not having a high school diploma, and they feel right now, I can't go to college, right? So we need to take that hurdle away. I mean, we do have a program on the New Mexico side, but it needs to be scaled up. I think that's the thing that we're always having a challenge on Navajo, is that we have, here's a good program, here's a good program, here's a good program, but it's not able to be scaled up to meet the needs of everybody. And I think this is something that I think we'd be very interested in for two reasons. One is the accessibility of it, and I think, and we also have a moral obligation 
right? Those students that did not get a high school diploma, we don't forget about them. You know, that's not our philosophy. We don't forget about people, but what do we do? And so I think this allows us to look at this as an accessibility issue, meaning breaking down barriers to get there. But in addition to that, it then goes back to our, you know, be, not trying to be altruistic here, it goes back to our growth. If we're able to help those students and then they come back to our college, our college then enrollment increases. So it has a twofold effect. And ultimately when they graduate, now they've increased and changed the trajectory of their future, but not just them, but as you mentioned, their families. You know, right now, my dad's, you know, a high school dropout. We help become a college graduate. That income has changed now. That trajectory of that family has changed forever. So these are the kinds of things that we really are interested in, in hearing from. So I really appreciate uh, you all coming. I didn't think, I didn't think anyone would show up today, but I, I'm already like, this is, uh, I'm psyched. So this is great, so thank you. I also want to add to that we've tried to shift our focus to focus to uh, working with the youth that are in our benefit group just because it's a repeated cycle of the youth um, you know once they graduate college they just go back into the TANF program so it's kind of like a generational thing that we've been encountering too so we feel that if we target the youth and try to break that cycle and we're gearing more of our efforts towards them to bring more exposure to them for college you know job readiness things to expect, you know, once you do graduate and stuff like that, that we're hoping that that, you know, breaks that, that cycle that they're going through. I think you really hit it on the head, the idea of college readiness or career readiness, right? Yeah. College, we're there. If they want to go to a trade school, mm -hmm. they're there too. So they have the skills to be able to do what they want instead of having doors shut to them. Okay, thank you. That was a great um, conversation starter as far as what we see in the future. Um, any more uh, comments that you would like to add? Or any of the um, vice presidents want to add anything to that as far as some of the plans they have going within their own di divisions? You know, we can accommodate all three areas that you mentioned. Um, I think one area, of course, we have six um, certificate programs at our college at this time, and we have another one coming through. We do have a CMA as well, and so we also have our Navajo Cultural Arts Program, which has uh, multiple um, pathways uh, all the way to the bachelor's degree level in terms of silversmithing, weaving, which is very unique from what um, type of programs that we offer at the new college. So um, with that, we, are also, we also have a business um, program and, and soon here hopefully looking at some uh, virtual incubators or physical in incubators. So in that sense, I'm just thinking about each of them, um, each of the categories you mentioned. Um, in Crown Point, we do have that adult education. I think you were kind of mentioned that. So there's there's always a path. You know, there's no there, there's no end. They can go from CEU into certificate, into associate, and business, and soon here master's degree. So I just want to mention that. There's opportunities. Yeah, I'd like, uh, I'm, I'm sure Vice President Nez would like to kind of jump in on this because, you know, a lot of times when you think about the next college, we just think about, I mean, we're here for a different reason, but we just think about Saley, mm -hmm. right? And then how do everybody, but part of, you know, we reorganize to have a greater emphasis on the community and the reservation at large. And so I'd like to uh, let VP Nez, Vice President uh, Marie Nez, kind of give you her perspective of this too. Um, so thank you again for um, your input and feedback. Um, we do have uh, micro campuses now uh, that we added, Newcomb and then also Anne of Utah. So your services that you mentioned are, you know, more in this area and so 
we're expanding also to the Utah area. Um, and then also, we have um, learned throughout the years that uh, the Tuba City area tends to be more in STEM too, like offering the math and science program, and then we have the medical assistant program. I think they're in their second uh, cohort right now. And so that's who we can collaborate with, and if that is, you know, the area that you want to explore too. Uh, Shiprock, we do have a new facility coming up to uh, the math and science uh, building that they are building right now. So more new building, more <coughs> math. And so that's another place where um, that's a good place to start as well. Uh, of course, the center here in Windrock, um, we want to also continue to offer some certificate programs here as well. Um, and then the one in Chindley, I that is um, closing down <coughs> just because that another group moved in, NTU, and I think you know a lot of students are going that way. So, but your feedback is really important to us um, to kind of get a lead on what programs um, to, to offer or even a certificate program. Um, and then I want to take my VP hat off. <laughs> and talk about um, my husband's business. And I had invited him to be here, but there is a real need out there. He's in the business of providing in-home care services uh, to the elderly out there. And oftentimes we are looking for young, strong um, people to care for the elderly because sometimes they have to help them with their mobility and there are certification involved in that area. And they're not college credit credit certification, but once they get the, those certifications, they are eligible for employment. It's really a needed um, employment there. Uh, for example, a set of uh, certification that one might need to provide in-home care or the transport service is that they have to be uh, certified in the CPR ADE first aid, um, and then how to prepare food, the food handlers permit, some a couple of background checks, um, and then uh, uh, others that are, you know, just part of small certification. They, it doesn't require enrollment at a college um, course. And so we had explored to say, okay, let's offer this uh, to all of the companies that are out there. And what we ran into is that we can't charge to teach or train those people unless if you're an accredited institution. So, and here, here, here's one that we can, you know, work and collaborate with everybody so that you know, we're put, putting people to work, too. And so now I take that one off. <laughs> so those are the centers and sites that I mentioned out there that, you know, you will more than welcome to reach out to them. Uh, Crown Point, as well as you have mentioned, adult education is there. Now, my understanding is that adult education can expand into the um, Arizona area uh, because we are... Our centers and sites are situated from in Arizona side and New Mexico <coughs> side, and then on the New Mexico side, we're offering adult education. And so if service is needed across the border to the Arizona side, it can happen as long as no other centers are providing that type of service too. And so we do have that GED program as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Vicky Nez. So um, just for the audience that just joined us, um, we are in the section of our community feedback segment for the strategic design of Bennett College. Um, we went through our strategic themes and presented them and started the conversation piece, but here's an opportunity for you um, as you are representing either your family or your institution that you may work at or your organization. But we're allowing um, individuals who joined us to just uh, provide some feedback and some guidelines to our future design of goals and objectives that will guide the college into the future upcoming years. 
Um, so we have a great representation from the Self-Reliance Program, and we just had a conversation about some areas that we can assist in terms of <laughs> academic development and programming. Also, of course, um, not forgetting our feeder population, which is potential students into Diné College, which includes our um, GED um, recipients. So I don't know if you two ladies want to share some comments, but you're more than welcome to. We appreciate your attendance as well. Um, we're open to ideas and feedback and recommendations, and we hope that it will drive our institution into a positive direction. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the floor is yours. All of a sudden, I felt eyes on you. <laughs> Not only eyes, but the camera's turned around to you, too. So there you go. All right, well, good afternoon. Do you have a Roberta Robertson? She had a Kiani Sloan told it evening, but she's seen touch it, but she's seen it. It's a best case, me, that's Shanala. And then that's true, but you had a issue. Navajo Department of Workforce Development. And um, I really appreciate the invitation. I tried to join online, but I, I could not. <laughs> so I s walked over, holding my skirt down in the wind. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, honey, yeah, you can make it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, I really appreciate the discussion. I have um, been reaching out to Diné College since I took over as a department manager for workforce development to have a dialogue very similar to this, and I have not been successful. No one has returned my emails, my media invites to Diné College, so I'm going to block you guys in and take That's the floor funny. for the rest <laughs> of the time. <laughs> I'm um, I say that with, with high hopes that I run a program for, um, for employment and training. I get a grant through the Department of Labor. And it's a federally funded program. I also get a grant from the Department of Health and Human Services called Native Employment Works. And both of them come to about 15 million a year. And they're level funded grant. We don't, it's all formula based, so um, we have to do more with less essentially. But out of our grant, 55% goes to what we call direct training costs. And that is specifically for individuals who want to come through our doors to service them. So that roughly equates to about $8 million. So when I started here, um, we were only working with providers um, off the Navajo Nation. And my immediate concern was, why can't this stay on Navajo Nation. We have tribal universities here. And so <clears throat> that was the reason I had reached out to Diné College and to NTU um, to establish that partnership. I'd like all of that eight million, if possible, to stay on Navajo mm -hmm. Nation. And fortunately, this is one of the silver linings of the pandemic, even though it's not a good thing, it forced us to go local. And I did change my service provider, um, meaning any uh, certificate programs, we can help fund and pay for. Temporary work experience, we can pay for that up to, up to 800 hours, roughly four months. <coughs> so during the pandemic, I, I switched to tribal and local preference, which is the priority from the president's office. To stay local. So in doing so, I added all of NTU and its campuses across the nation and, and Diné College the same way. Unfortunately, I don't have any partnership with Diné College. Um, we're barely starting NTU. And it's, it's ironic. I, I, it's, it's really hard for me to understand why we want to look past our own to places like Brooklyn or Carrington, um, when we have served those programs here. And when um, our participants go off the reservation, they want to come back and work here. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. <coughs> so I'm trying to line up the two. Um, I know Diné College has 
an accounting certificate program. And I'm trying to work with Navajo Nation's DPM to have a conversation about um, the qualifications for an AMS, Account Maintenance Specialist. If you visit the Navajo Nation job vacancy, uh, that's all you see. And that's what's in the communities, right? That's where our people want to work. Where they're from, like me, Namash Chitty. If I could work in Namash Chitty, mm -hmm. I would want to stay there, but I don't want to be a teacher. Uh, I don't want to be a chapter official. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to be um, part of, you know, I don't want to go to see what's the other thing. We have three churches there. So I thought, no, I don't, don't want to do that. <clears throat> so the, 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 to be an administrator of a program, you have to travel at least 50 to 60 miles one way every day. So that's what I do. And so when I say I understand the needs of the Navajo people and wanting to return home, I absolutely know what that means. Because 60 miles, just miles, went one way. And the people <coughs> that qualify for my program is almost everyone. This is an individual-based program. It's not income-based. It's not household-based. Mm -hmm. It's individual. <coughs> and so the criteria is really open. So this conversation I'm really excited about. And I had to give you a little bit of background about my program because I am positive you have students who might have some financial needs or gaps that are in your, um, in, at your schools that I could help, but they don't come to us. <laughs> and we don't have a partnership to where any of your certificate programs we should be a revolving door. We sh I should be sending people there all the time um, and then bringing them back out to work in the communities. Uh, I should be able to connect and have some type of internship possibly. <coughs> so that's what I'm after and that's what I want to bring here today. So in reviewing what is the need on the Navajo Nation right now, <coughs> CDL is one of them. CDL certificate program with heavy equipment endorsement. CNA is another one, um, and accounting is another one. Um, beyond that, um, we look at, there's a lot of cooks position, you know. So A dot Aggie is what's high in demand, but the short, shortfall is um, when they get through their our work experience or they attain the certificate, they still have no job experience, really, that would mm -hmm. help them get into one of these positions on the nation. It, it just, again, uh, I think we're, we have too many gaps. <clears throat> so with that said, um, I've been, um, I have five field offices and five sub-offices that serve the Navajo Nation. And again, eligibility is very relaxed, and almost everybody could, could get into my program. I say almost. <laughs> but I don't have a I don't have a partnership with them in college. I don't I don't know if you guys even know we exist. Navajo Department of Workforce <laughs> Development. And I can pay for their certificate. I can pay for their transportation. I can pay for their meals. I can pay for even clothing for them. This is all eligible, allowable costs. And I know I'm, I'm being film, but I have money right now. I can't <laughs> spend it. <laughs> I want to give you all some. How do we do that? Um, so, and we don't do degree program dates. Um, and that's part of the, one of the um, policies regs that come with this, is certificate vocational training and work experience. And this is a really good ideal time for me to sit here because um, in, um, in July, my program year ends and I have to apply for a new grant for the next four years, it's a competitive grant. In that grant plan, I say how I'm gonna provide services to the Navajo people. And I wanna be able to include my two tribal colleges and their priorities and expectations but I need to know what they are and how we can become better partners than what we are now. So I will stop there for now, and and hopefully your ears are raised, <laughs> you know, um, 
and curiosity that there's federal dollars, millions of federal dollars that I want to give to my tribal colleges through assisting uh, participants through my program. So with that, thank you for the opportunity, thank you for the time, and I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say first, uh, good to see you again. Right. Uh, and, and also, I apologize now I'll get back to you. If I were to show you a picture of my computer screen in my office, I have a yellow post-it of your name and phone number still sitting there from 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 Can there. You so send I, me that. I, 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 I'll send you a picture to prove it. But so it is something that we are interested in, and I'm really sorry that we didn't get in touch with you. And I think what maybe what we could do is in a in the morning come and meet with all of you, and then the afternoon come and meet here to actually say you know we're committed to this and we'd like to actually have that conversation. So. Uh, I, I think there are some things I'm sure uh, Geraldine uh, is thinking about also as we go forward. That some of those items are things that we could probably address, but also it talks about the expansion and growth of our college to not just be, we had a conversation with uh, the Provost Council earlier about the, uh, the dual mission institutions. And a dual mission institution is somebody that still offers certificates and associates, but also bachelor's and graduate degrees and so we were just talking about trying to reposition and define ourselves and I think this is something that I think kind of pushes us in that direction uh, in a way that I think we we'd like to address that so Gerald I don't know if you have any yeah, questions or comments and then we'll come back to you okay and I, I do appreciate you coming today I'm so glad you were able to just walk on over <laughs> can you <laughs> walk in your back gate for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we have six um, certificate programs mm -hmm. I think that would be very helpful um, I was just mentioning earlier that we have certificate in native um, Navajo arts um, as well as um, Navajo leadership we also have the CMA program, but it, it is at, um, in Tuba City, but I'm sure we can make some type of um, arrangements and um, beaming that to the site as well. We also have the certificate in public health. Um, at this time, I think that is one program that's very popular. Um, there are other certificate programs. I can't remember all of them here, but we do have natural resource um, just recently that the irrigation technician and the, um, so computer technology. Those are some of the certificate programs we have. But um, as we're moving forward, there are other certificate programs that are in discussion as well. Um, of course, it's all in the health field. Community health was one that was brought um, this morning to our provost council as, again. So, um, and, and definitely we'll I'll reach out and ensure that we get some partnership in place. And I think a big part of these, you know, development of new programs, new certificates, whatever, is is there a need, right? right. Mm -hmm. You create a new certificate and then nobody shows up and you know you waste it all that time. So yeah. basing it on need is one of those things that we've kind of flipped around right now. What is the potential for growth? Again, coming back to one of our themes. Mm -hmm. But the idea there is something I think that we're, that's why we'd really be interested in this, that this would be something that would be generated by ideas from what the need is out there. Right. Where is their jobs within the reservation? All of those elements right. that we have to go through in the development yeah. of a certificate program or a new program, yeah. you know, you've already done a lot of that work, so <laughs> it's a lot easier yeah. than for us to just figure out how that fits in. You know, I want to formalize that through um, a solid report. I think the Napa Nation would be would benefit a whole lot from that. We don't have we have economic development. To me, that's different than yeah. like say Department of Labor, where we have a we have a pool of mm -hmm. um, skilled laborers for different things. Not necessarily owners or entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but skilled labor. Yes. And with this infused ARPA dollars, contracts are coming. And that's what I'm looking at too. Is like all this infrastructure money and this construction money is going to warrant some skills yeah. in project management, construction management, CDL, I mean, and then just general labor. How then can I get those skill sets and have them ready for all these jobs because we have Navajo preference, we have labor laws, 
but do we have the skilled now yeah. workers? I don't know. I don't. I think there's a gap, and so that needs analysis is, is something that is really important for me because how am I going to push, um, you know, getting this labor pool if I don't know what the real need is, and that ties hand in hand with what you're just were saying now is what certificate program is necessary needed on the Navajo Nation, and then how then do we partner, and maybe through MOU say, this is the process, this is the intake, and we're going to fill all your classroom chairs, you know, um, and of course, the, you know, my direct training cost has a maximum, and my dream is to say, um, we're already, we're already reserved in seats for the next four years. Um, and this is what I'm going to reserve for Dinah College, this is what I'm going to reserve for this, and work experience. Um, so that when the grant plan comes in for the next four years, I'm already set. Mm -hmm. I don't data. We're kind of, I'm kind of running around. I don't know if you guys can see the fire extinguisher on my back right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> there's some cleanup, yes, but I want to be able to say that we need to have this conversation so we can be ready to help one another. And at the end of the day, really bring our Navajo people to the work that they're looking for, to the careers that they're desiring. Yeah, I think workforce development is just is, is so important, but there's no strategic plan for right. that. There's nothing that's saying, okay, from here to there, here's the economy that this addresses, here's this economy, here's mm -hmm. that. Let's have a plan that addresses those different areas of need. Right. But yeah. I agree. I would be happy to share my strategic plan, my okay. four-year strategic plan. All right. You had a yes. I was going to say, I'm Roberta. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> um, but I was just going to mention that we do similar to what they do as well. So what she was talking about were there was funds to uh, pay for their students to go through your certification programs. That's what we do too. So we have the funds available for them as well to get that going and. Um, just wanted to mention that too, but our requirements are different than theirs too. So hers, like she was saying, are more relaxed than ours because for us we have to have children in the benefit group. So that's the one requirement that we offer. So we serve more of like the family base, but theirs is more relaxed and open to more people. So we're to the same point pretty much. <laughs> I'm going to say one more thing too. Yesterday, and I, and I have to say, you know, um, you gotta believe in a higher power, right? <laughs> I have money, so. But yesterday. Is that the higher power you're? <laughs> no. You're confusing no, me. No, I'm her. saying, um, <laughs> as as Shania once told me, why are you so nervous, Shadeja? You have a good problem. You have a money problem. Uh, so I have a peso, I thought then. Yeah, and that was Mr. Peterson's uh, honorable yeah. Peterson's uh, shift. I always remembered that, and I do have a good money yeah. problem. Uh, and I have two grants <laughs> available. And yesterday I got a call, yesterday, not yesterday, last week I got a call and yesterday I had a meet and greet. And I had the people from the regional and uh, national SNAP program. Mm -hmm. uh, the SNAP program also has employment and training monies. Same thing, they have a degree um, associates, they can fund associates similar to mine. They don't have a partnership on Navajo, so they're wondering if I can do it. And so they're, um, we're having discussions there, and <laughs> the thing about them was they're pretty flexible. The only thing is they have to be a SNAP recipient. I gather that data all the time. So I'm beginning to look at those and say, okay, hypothetically, uh, if we were to move, what percentages, how can I help, how can I present this to become a partner with SNAP to maybe fill the gaps that I can't fill for whatever reason. And their program sounds even more flexible. <laughs> and they pretty much said the same thing. Oh, there's no limit right now. We could help to any one way. Okay. So apparently there's more money available that could come to the Navajo Nation. And they are not working with the Navajo Nation right now for those dollars and they, they said overall they get $300 million and they really need some recipients of those employment and training. Now even if I could connect them to, I don't know, maybe another department, even myself, 
or even through your office, how we can help those individuals attain those types of financial assistance. That might even be very beneficial as well, too. So I'll give more information. I'm going to get it right now. It's like wide open, so I'll, be, I'll, I'll get all the specifics. And then um, I want to be keeping that in the back of my mind that there's other federal dollars that could benefit a lot of our tribal members to get um, to attain their certificate or even associate degrees. No, I, I mean, I, I think from our, as I'm listening to, 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 to the two of you, that I'm sure Geraldine's thinking the same thing and, and, and Maria's thinking the same thing. You know, a lot of these, these are problems that have been around for a long time, right? In other words, the workforce and our families and how do we try to bridge. I think the idea that we're looking at is really seriously for the last couple of years is how can Dinette College be a part of that solution? in terms of providing that. And I think right now, you know, I have a few ideas in terms of creating an initiative that really goes after um, aggressively being able to respond to what you're both talking about. If we just go back through this whole slow process and we wait till September 22, you know, we're losing a, a lot of the momentum. So what can we do right now? Geraldine, I know she's probably thinking about what do we have to do in terms of our accreditation with the Higher Learning Commission? for certain programs, what do we have to do for other things? All of that we can do, like you said, from our perspective, it's a good problem to have, right? That there's a need out there, they're coming to us, and you know, we don't sit there and lock the doors and turn off the lights and put the shades down. <laughs> we actually open the windows and the doors and say, come on in and let's, let's try to figure this out. Yeah. Because I think this is what we're talking about is growth. But the other part of it also is, you know, again, coming from the perspective, if they get a certificate, that they might stick around and try to then on their own get a college degree, you know. So, I mean, there's something there for us also in terms of just providing the program is one thing and the, the instruction and the certificate and stuff. But ultimately, you know, I keep throwing around this, this, this thing, this data point, and I'm sure these guys are tired of me hear, uh, of, of hearing it. But within the Navajo Nation, not outside, but just within our boundaries, whether you're Navajo, non-Navajo, or whatever, there's 29,000 people who have some college and no degree. 29,000 within. That's not counting Gallup, Farmington, or people that you know commute. That's just within our reservation. 29,000. If we start making a dent in that, you can just see what that would do to help boost our economy. That's not even talking about those that don't even think about going to college. You know, some of the ones that we're talking about, the ones that dropped out, don't have a high school diploma. That that number is even larger, probably. And just think of that impact that it would have, just from a purely economic perspective, right. what it would do to the Navajo economy if all of a sudden you had a workforce that was not having to come in, that was not having to be trained, that was already there. And as we pivot to a new economy, so I think this is. This is something that we're really interested in, both and, of you. And even to add to that, if you want to take away, not just let's just put the vocational certificate program aside. Employers to gain that knowledge and skill sets. We, we do that not as often as I'd like. Mm -hmm. We don't go to the graduation days and sit there and say, sign up for our program. We can connect you with you know the job you want. I had a young lady who came through my program. And bless her heart, she had her master's in biology. <laughs> zero, literally zero. Not even a chapter house job experience. <laughs> and she shouldn't be penalized for that. So I took her in, and at that time, this was pre-pandemic, we got her connected with IG and the pharmacy. She only worked a month under my program and they took her in. They, they found out what val val valuable knowledge she had and they just hired her. Um, never mind all the prior job experience was required <laughs> before, but through my training program, they just put her in. There's another young man, and I didn't catch him in time. He graduated from ASU with a law degree tried to come to DOJ, no one would even look at him. So we touched base and I wanted him to do the work experience
for my office as a policy analyst. I'm like, I'll show you what DOJ could do. Um, unfortunately, a firm out in the Valley picked him back up and an internship, and he didn't stay here. You know, um, those are just two yeah. examples. But you're graduates. I, I, I plan to be at the graduation to say, mm -hmm. come see us. <laughs> we can help in work readiness. Let's teach you about benefits. Let's teach you internships. Is on-the-job training. Let me get employers committed to considering on-the-job training. All of this is, we've been around for 50 plus years, yeah. and, and we're just now having this type of taking the blinders off, if you will, yeah. thinking outside the box. But we should be at your graduation. We should have that type of partnership to say, fake advisors, this group right here of 50 is potentially needs to come to your program and get them skilled and trained and then find them a worksite location. At the same time, they can still job search with bigger companies or enterprises on an Navajo Nation. So I, I just get really excited. <laughs> I, have another, I have another fire burning over here. I'm like, this is going to happen. It has to happen sooner than later. But I think that when you look at that side of your, your graduates, there's still a huge opportunity for partnership to help them. Uh, so, anyhow, I, I digress. I apologize. Thank you. No, I apologize. <laughs> Monty, can I also add uh, some perspective yes. here? Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, department of the Net Education, uh, pandemic acting superintendent acting assistant superintendent. Uh, so thank you again for this opportunity to have public input on uh, Diné College's uh, strategic um, vision and journey. Uh, and I do want to uh, speak about the K-12 education uh, and how we can uh, become better partners uh, to provide a quality education for our students in the preschool doll, uh, 12th grade on the whole. Uh, also an investment uh, in our school leaders as well. Uh, from our perspective of Department of the Net Education during the pandemic, We've had to pivot and make so many changes uh, that have forever impacted the way we instruct our children. Uh, in person to online, for instance, which required a different skill set for our teachers. Uh, and the issues and topics that face our children, such as the need to have that human connection, social emotional learning, those type of things have come to forefront and then the parent involvement as well. Many of our parents became the facilitators of education uh, through online learning. Computers uh, For many, many years, those of us in education, we've had technology standards. K-12 system. And there are some responsibilities, I believe, within our K-12 schools to also engage the parents as to what does that mean, the digital citizenship of our children uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Those things came to light and forefront uh, during the pandemic. And I feel that it's important to uh, have an opportunity for us to look to our tribal education and universities on the organizational change, what's important, how do you make that change within a local school setting. Um, a few uh, months ago, we had a conversation with the education chair from UNM seeking a sustainable professional development for school leaders. Now, I believe that we shouldn't look past our local colleagues uh, uh, school leaders than Linigi. We know the issues. How how does that education system look differently from that of the nation, opposed to the the, the tribally controlled schools? There are differences, 
in policies, for example. There are differences in how we engage the local leadership. So I believe we need to create opportunities for that sustainable professional development as a way to invest in our school leaders, uh, whether that is CEUs uh, for our uh, staff members. And then as we look at our, uh, the makeup of our school leaders as well, some are non-natives. How do we do an outreach to them to give them the topic of being that culturally sensitive and to truly be a part of those communities so that we are impactful in the ways that we, we should be uh, in our leadership roles. So I hope that we can partner a, and establish a support system for our school leaders. As Sahadi in their silos, uh, lo locales, they have been trying to mitigate uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And so how do we become a greater resource for our uh, school leaders so that they can be the best uh, school leaders uh, in our schools. They are in charge of our youth, so how do we do that? And, that, and I think we have a responsibility to discuss that uh, and uh, strengthen that. I also uh, wanted to uh, discuss the, the language preservation uh, that has become very uh, much highlighted as well. Uh, as COVID hit our communities. The older uh, age population was uh, afflicted uh, and resulted in a number of deaths. Those are the uh, age groups that had a uh, greater knowledge of how to utilize our Navajo language and may have been using it more so on a day-to-day -day basis aside from just the conversational language. So how do we uh, merge these partnerships. We have a subcommittee uh, within the Navajo Nation Council, the Nebizad subcommittee. Department of Diné Education having uh, a process to certify uh, teachers based on a proficiency exam. And then again, within our school settings, students becoming proficient by way of taking the assessment that has been established by DODI. And then the nation's vision about making Navajo the first language and a mandatory language to be utilized, utilized in government processes uh, and enterprises as well. So how do we support that? Uh, and how do we strengthen that? I know that there have been some uh, coursework and some degrees made available through Diné College, but how are we working truly with our teachers uh, who are in the K-12 classrooms, the parents as well. You can teach a student uh, inside a classroom how to work with the Nel language and culture, but that has to also be built upon in the home setting as well. So what do we do to uh, increase uh, the skill uh, and capacity of our parents as well? So those are some things that I think we, we should talk about. Uh, and I, I'm very grateful for today's conversation to uh, impart those suggestions and recommendations. And then another piece also is Department of Diné Education has been working for quite some time to establish a repository uh, for data. We, we can't uh, make any plans to uh, remediate or redress any uh, issues where student outcomes are concerned, student achievement, if we don't have access to the data. We need to gain access to student information so that we can identify what are the areas of need. And we need to rely on our tribal college and universities to uh, make those redress uh, for student improvement and for outcomes are concerned. Uh, so I know that these would require uh, more specifics to talk about, but we have uh, across the Navajo Nation, uh, our students by way that they are measured with standardized assessments are always behind. I don't think that should be the case. Our students can and should be able to be measured in a way that they have the same uh, level of knowledge and, and ability to uh, function uh, compared to their same grade uh, and age level peers off the nation. So those are some real critical pieces that I think we, we ought to be talking about. 
And I also want to uh, just reiterate uh, Dr. Uh, Harold Begay, our newly appointed superintendent of school sentiment, uh, around uh, the suggestion uh, to expand uh, the campuses across Navajo Nation. Uh, this would create accessibility for all age levels of students. You might have a preschool child accompany mom who's in, uh, enrolled in a class to that center uh, for whatever purpose. May maybe it's tutorial support, maybe it's to gain access to the internet and computers. Uh, it, we just need to expand uh, that this isn't something that is just available to uh, somewhat a, a, a socio-stratified uh, uh, way. Uh, so once we begin to make access universal, I believe we wouldn't be so worried about growth. Uh, we would create that uh, by way of investing and strengthening the ways that we currently uh, are engaging our clientele, so to speak. So I just want to offer uh, those recommendations, and I do appreciate the opportunity to provide uh, recommendations and suggestions. Thank you, Pat. I, you know, I think as I'm listening to Pat talk and, and, and the two of you talk, I think one of the things that comes to mind is this idea of saying, okay, we talked about earlier this idea of, you know, we have too many silos, right? I mean, you have this program, here are these things, you have this program, here are those elements. But how do we try to look at that differently? And so if you try to then take this idea of greater accessibility and growth is to create centers, and I don't know if the right word for HLC is centers, or learning, or whatever it is, that provides different things. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop, right? So. Uh, you can have a building that's available. And then on that side is classes or training for your program. On this side is something for your program. And then we have another area that can provide childcare services. And then you can have people that could come actually for um, uh, college classes. And I think because the first thing we think about, first thing I'm thinking about is as we start looking at these new areas of growth, is how are we gonna pay for it, right? What's the threshold level of the number of people in a community to take classes so that we actually can continue programming. But if you're talking about it, that you're gonna provide workforce you know, development on this side, you're gonna provide the TANF on this side, we now have a shared piece of the pie so that we're able then to create these different sites across the reservation by not one person picking up the whole cost, right? and that we actually are looking at ways that might be different. And that's just with us three, and I don't know if you can do that with your funding. I'm not saying we're asking for that, but it makes us change the way we're looking at a problem, right? It makes us start looking to think, who else could be a part of this that could help talk about that? And, uh, you know, we did some of that early on in the pandemic, but then, you know, this administration just shut everything down, so you really couldn't do anything other than just, you know, wait until it ended. And so I think now that we have to be strategic as we go forward, because things are gonna change a little bit in that sense. You had a question? Yeah, I was gonna say, well, I think first of all, our, our group of customers with um, Roberta's customers could create one cohort, and we could develop it to where we have, you know, both of our students together in one classroom. Because that's what we're doing with San Juan College. We have half of the classroom um, with our customers and then the other half are just regular San Juan College students. But I think with both of us together, we could probably make up one full classroom and one cohort that would be able to work together. But that's just an idea. <laughs> no, I agree, and I think that's kind of part of the, the conversation, is how are you gonna pay for this, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you have to think that, you have to think that, you have to think that. How do you try to pay for this? And if you're all sharing something, and maybe it's, you know, someone's only giving this much, others are giving that much, that does have an impact. So I think looking at accessibility in a different way, I think is, is, is really good. And I think if we tie that into, you know, talk about language preservation, you know, that in this area, you know, you're almost creating your own language nest, right? You're creating these, you know, opportunities for people to come together. That can be integrated within this idea also going forward because I think, I think what the net college has and we, we, we've been talking about this at the Net College for, for, for a while now, 
We have the ability to offer classes, that's one thing. But like a lot of universities and colleges, we have the ability to convene. In other words, you bring people together. You don't have that too often in too many places on the reservation. But if you think about like what happens in Arizona, ASU, together. So you have the different, you know, expertise that can be brought together to say, let's try to solve this problem. And I think, you know, in looking at, I'm not saying this is a problem, it's a challenge, you know, what Pat's talking about in terms of these different areas. But you're also talking about in terms of the parenting side, how do you help your child do better in school? How do you engage with, you know, I tell these people the story all the time, and that is, you know, I went through education, I got a doctorate, but man, nothing scared me worse than parent-teacher conferences. <laughs> and to have to sit there with a the teacher, you know, I was just like, yes ma'am, okay, yes, yes ma'am. I didn't know what to ask, even though I'd gone through this whole thing, but just having, you know, some empowerment there can have a huge impact on breaking the cycle that you talked about earlier but also then the economic development, but then also then looking at how do you build this with education. So I think that's part of this idea when we talked about one of the strategic themes, at least I'm thinking about listening to all of you, is that holistic integration. This is not a workforce issue, this is not an education issue, this is not a family issue. This is really about, okay, how do we build a capacity of each individual? And then the, the, the sphere of influence that they have as either a member of their family, member of the community, member of the Navajo Nation. So looking at it from a different perspective in terms of what are we trying to solve here? What are we trying to address? You know, I didn't, you know, when we came here this, this morning, I didn't think we'd be having this deep of a conversation, I'll be honest. But I think, you know, the, 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 the school leader initiative, I wholeheartedly agree with, you know, what can we do to try to get that? You know, years ago, if you recall, ASU and Doty created a Navajo School Administrators Program. Mm -hmm. And it was specific to Navajo. So they talked about Navajo finance, Navajo law, Navajo curriculum for Navajo. Not Arizona state law in, in, in uh, finance or New Mexico state law. So it's really focused here. They just dabbled a little on the other state stuff. But providing that. In a, you know, in a certificate, if you will. And maybe it's a CEU certificate as opposed to, you know, the other, but providing that type of process that this is, you know, you, you, all of our administrators need to know this, period, right? And allowing for that, you know. Don't get me going into educational policy, though. We're gonna be here all night, but I, I'll stop there, though. I don't know, Geraldine, if you have any other question, or Roberta. You know, I just wanna maybe add a little bit to the piece. I, I really appreciate just the statement of how to build the capacity of each individual. That, that's what I'm looking at. I'm not looking to come in to say, you must create all of these, but there is a need. How are you gonna address that? The pandemic. You know, I thought, my, my, my daughter, I have three grandkids, two of them are uh, virtual learning. I'm grateful my daughter was um, working towards her elementary education, so that little classroom time she had, she had to put it to, to use. Mm -hmm. However, it required her to now shift to a 24-7 mother-teacher role <laughs> throughout the day, yeah. and literally, yeah, I watched my daughter just literally almost go nuts right in front of me. Just having that type of responsibility. And so when I get off work, I try to get home by 6.30 and I, and I take the kids from her so she can have a little bit of peace. All shade, taking a bath, getting ready for bed. And I'll go home, and I don't call a you know. And as I was doing that, what came to mind was, the kids 
They, they need that social interaction. Mm -hmm. They need the, the recess. They need their buddies. <laughs> their, and my grandson wasn't getting that. And so she couldn't afford to work. So I had to step in and be the provider simply because she needed to be a parent. And when she wasn't a parent, she had to be an educator. Mm -hmm. And I thought, OK, how, does, how can I contribute from workforce development? Mm -hmm. I tried. I tried to say, OK, let's think outside the box. Maybe the work experience can be remote learning. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can pay the parents when they're teaching, the hours they teach. We can count that as work experience hours mm -hmm. and, and, and pay them to be teachers at home. And if there's any training that we can help with mm -hmm. the, the school or the education program, maybe we put that into our training program. And so that um, they can at least have some income as mm -hmm. well. And I, I recognize firsthand that parents were not cut out to be educators. <laughs> Nor was I, as an administrator, cut out to be a nurse or first yeah. responder, <laughs> having been forced to make tough decisions with COVID and my team, protecting my team, and learning how to read medical statements. Is like, <laughs> if I wanted to be a nurse, I would have gone into that <laughs> field. You know? But I realized there's the pandemic forced us to be, you know, resourceful and, and then forcing us to build our own capacities mm -hmm. and, and forcing us to be stronger, better people because of it. And the sad part is we lost a lot of resources along mm -hmm. the way too. So as I'm talking to workforce, I see um, and get a lot of young people um, who want to enter the workforce, but they themselves don't have the business etiquette required to work mm -hmm. in the work workplace. So beyond my training, mm -hmm. we hold our hands, if you will, you know, and she has your adult and I, you know, kind of plead with you. And she's still late. She still eats when she's supposed to. She does. She doesn't put her mask back on unless she's told, you know. So we have to remind her. So I know when she gets into the work so workforce she's not going to last. Mm -hmm. And so those barriers is what also I'm looking at. Not just workforce, not just our uh, participant, but exactly what you said. And the Net College and the Education Department, uh, our leadership, they're all key in helping us, my program, have our individuals reach their capacity and, you know, become self-sustaining, that's the ultimate goal, but I never want to say, oh, they're, they're just my participant, they're challenged. We're all in this together, and um, some of our, our people want to go back to school, but I had a young lady who was very, I could tell she was very traditional. She, she would make eye contact, talking a little slow, and real shy and reserved. But she wanted to be an AMS instructor wow. in her community. But she didn't want to apply for my program. She didn't want to go to school either. And I, I tried and, uh, to talk to her. Then finally, I just said, OK, you know, when you're ready, these are available. And at the end of a conversation, she says, let me question it. And uh, oh, what? You know, and <laughs> just roll it. And then she said, she points at my laptop, deep in us. Mm. And I said, that's OK. Should I open us? You know? <laughs> and I can teach you. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to go back to school? Mm. And she said, yes. And she, she, she said she had two children at home. And she lived with no infrastructure. And she was good with that. Mm. But she was afraid, and she had no experience with the computer. Otherwise, she said she did at college is right there next to me. I'm close by, but I don't want to go because I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things mm -hmm. is, how do we get a program, or how do I get a professional teacher to come in and teach my participants 
how to operate this, but also bring um, an empathy to say, it's okay to be scared. You know, I can do computer classes, but you know that's all strict curriculum and all of this, but that, yeah, that, that only exists on Navajo, on Navajo is missing. And so we have very, we have people who don't stay committed to work, that, are not, that don't become successful because these curriculums pushes them to say, you know what, I'll stay in my hogan, I'm okay. So, but again, the ones that suffer are the children, you know? And so I, I, again, I could have this dialogue with you all day and pick your brain, pick everybody's brain, because that's what it's going to take for me to have a successful program. Asahai kojir, and and that's an example of we've been in existence for 50 years, and it's like driving in the rut during a, after a rainstorm. You don't <laughs> want to go onto the side because you might slide off. You know, you step. So we, we we get into the rut and we gun it because we know we can probably make it through. Put on hichas anahalim. So I want to be able to get out of that, and I want to be able to say. Dinner College is a good resource for you. My participants that are coming, but they get back to the key. How do we get them connected with you to say they if they want that learning? And then how do we teach parents that come into my program to multitask and be better teachers at home? She's it's okay to the She just put the two together now. She's not a very good teacher, she's never a good mom because she's tired and she does not got she doesn't have formal training. So um, kids are ready to go back to the classroom, parents are ready to be parents again <laughs> and we're not making good progress in trying mm -hmm. to bring that resource together. So I think I have that capability to do that and to explore more different ways instead of just being strict with my silo. I, I want to be able to say, bring, bring you this and bring you this and kodo, kodo. And so, um, I don't know, I'm just really excited about this opportunity and <laughs> I, I want to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, you all need to help me and I can help you as well too. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Conversations. Um, we want to give a special thank you to the Navajo Nation Workforce Development, DOTI, and Navajo Nation Office of Self Reliance for joining our conversation today. Um, we do have two executives um, who joined us virtually, so I just wanted to thank them as well. We have um, VP Glenita Haskey, who represents the Student Affairs Department, Student Success Department of Diné College, and they actually wanted to just share that they really enjoyed the conversation and just as everyone was doubting that no one would come here, um, they were like really excited and they were ready to take on the next challenge for Diné College. And then we also had our Vice President of Finance and Administration, um, VP Bo Lewis, and she was also um, very um, engaged in the conversation and she just wanted to say thank you to everyone who attended in person as well. Um, and before you leave, but I'll probably do a follow-up email. Um, we have a survey link there. It's probably best I send you an email, um, but you're more than welcome to fill it out. It really is just demographic information, and then of course, feedback on how we did here with our first um, strategic town hall meeting in person. Um, with that said, that concludes our event. Thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. I took